In this video, we're going to look at this example problem here. Um, so we'll just kind of look at what we're given. Uh, we have a vector valued function here. Notice that this one's labeled v of t. So uh, in this context, when we have a v of t and r of t, we should recognize that that v of t represents a velocity vector. And then the r of t would be the position vector. And so remembering that that velocity vector is really the same thing as the derivative of the position vector. So we could also say that this is uh, r prime of t or d r dt if you want to use that kind of notation. Um, all right, so we're given a velocity vector. Uh, we're given another vector here. Notice that this is a position vector r evaluated at a specific t value. So this is when t equals zero. Uh, this is uh, just some numbers here uh, in our components for our vector. So uh, when t equals zero, we just get this specific vector and we are supposed to find r of t here. So what we want is this position function as a function of t for all t. Okay, so uh, even if you hadn't seen an example of a specific problem like this, you should be able to put together some knowledge from Calculus 1 uh, together with what you've been working with with vector-valued functions to think about how you would do this, right? You're essentially given a derivative function and you want to find the original function, so you need to undo that derivative, undo that differentiation. So you're going to find antiderivatives, indefinite integrals. Uh, there are a little bit of subtleties to think about here because you're working with a vector function instead of just an ordinary function, so that's kind of what I want to emphasize here. But the idea of being given a derivative and being asked to find the original function, that should be pretty natural thinking about how to do that based on your prior calculus knowledge here. Okay, so let's just go ahead and dig in on this problem then. Uh, so my r of t then is going to be an indefinite integral of this uh, derivative vector. So I'll just write that vector notation here. And we're going to find the antiderivative with respect to t. And uh, if you think about how you differentiate vector-valued functions and understand that here you're just reversing that process, uh, if I'm given a vector-valued function and I want to find the derivative of that, you really just do that component by component, as long as all those derivatives are defined. And so you're going to find an antiderivative the same way. So you don't always necessarily have to write it like this, but I'm going to write this step here just to kind of emphasize what we're doing. Uh, so the antiderivative of this vector function, I'm going to find by just finding antiderivatives of each of these component functions. So I'll get a vector function and I'm going to integrate 2t with respect to t, and that will give me what's in my uh, i component for the r of t vector here, and then the integral of 1 over 1 plus t squared dt will tell me what's going on in the j component, and then the integral of e to the 2t in the k component. Okay, and you don't have to write it like this. You can just find those antiderivatives and keep track of what component they're going to be in. But part of the reason I wrote it like this here is that I want to emphasize something about uh, what happens when you get indefinite integrals and thinking about how that is slightly different here because we're dealing with a vector function than just an ordinary function. All right, so these first two antiderivatives are pretty easy. Those are ones you probably should recognize. Uh, so the antiderivative of 2t is t squared uh, plus c. And sometimes you're used to just putting a big plus c on at the end, but I'm going to go ahead and kind of keep track of that here. Uh, and then the antiderivative here, this is one you should remember from Calc 1, and you probably used it quite a bit in Calculus 2 as well. Uh, so this is the inverse tangent function plus c. And here is where I want to pause for a moment and talk a little bit about this. So sometimes uh, when you learned to do antiderivatives in Calc 1, maybe you kept track of plus c's kind of throughout the problem. Or sometimes students just get in the habit of putting a big old plus c on at the end of the problem. And that's worked fine for everything you've encountered up till this point. But I want you to pay attention here to the fact that this c is in the i component of my vector 
and this C is in the J component of my vector. And so in the same way that I can't just add 2T and 1 plus T squared together and like somehow combine those, I can't really combine these into a single big plus C at the end. Um, so I have a different C perhaps in the I component and a different C in the J component, and then I'll also have one in the K component. So I tend to just leave them like this and use some subscripts here. Uh, these are not the same C's, so I'd want something to distinguish between them. You can use C1, C2, C3, or you could use different letters than C, C, K, and something else for another constant. I'm just going to use subscripts here. So C1 and C2. And then in the K component, technically there's a little U substitution in this antiderivative. U equals 2T, DU is 2DT, and then with that extra 2 there, you're going to divide through by 2, so you get a 1 half. Uh, so 1 half E to the 2T plus C3. Okay, so I've got these constants uh, in my different components of the vector. That's one of the things I wanted to emphasize here in thinking about that these are really separate antiderivatives. Um, the other piece of information that I have here in this problem is some information here about this position vector at a specific t value. And you might remember doing problems like this from Calculus 1. It's a thing that you sometimes do when you first talk about undoing derivatives or doing antiderivatives, where you're given a value that you can use to find the c's. So this is actually called an initial value here when I have a specific value of the function. It's often called initial value because it's often given at input 0, but it doesn't have to be necessarily. Um, so I have a value of that vector valued function at a specific input, and I can use that then to find the c's. Okay, so I'm just going to put t equals 0 into my function here, and then when I get that answer, uh, it should be equal to i plus 3k, which I'm going to put in the uh, bracket and comma notation here, uh, 1, 0, 3, just so I'm careful about what is, what is the i and what is the k, and that the j component there has a 0 there. Okay, so I'll just do that work over here. Um, so let's see, when I put t equals 0 into this vector valued function, I'm going to write down a few more steps than you might need to here. But I'll have 0 squared, which is obviously 0, plus c1, and then tangent inverse of 0, which is also 0, plus c2, and then 1 half e to the 2t, uh, I'm going to put in t equals 0, so I'll have 1 half e to the 0, which is not 0, plus c3, and that's going to be equal to my vector 1, 0, 3. Okay. Uh, so if those two vectors are equal, it means that their corresponding components are equal to each other. So you can do some work here in vector notation, or you can just do it component by component. Uh, in the i component, uh, this vector simplifies to just c1. And so that's going to have to be equal to 1. And in the j component, this tangent inverse of 0 is 0. We get 0 plus c2, so c2. And that's going to have to be equal to the j component here, 0. And then in the k component, uh, this simplifies to 1 half plus c3. And that's going to have to be equal to 3. All right, so here I'm going to have to do just a little step of algebra to find my c3, subtract 1 half from both sides. So c3 is 5 halves, or 2.5. Um, all right, so uh, in particular, sometimes students just say, okay, well, these numbers here are my constants. Th these numbers here are my c1, c2, and c3. And you might notice that that's not always true. Uh, so when these functions evaluated to 0, that is true. Uh, but when these functions that I have here do not evaluate to 0, then you've got to think that through and figure out what your c3 is, right? So your component is equal to that 3, and you've got to do a little algebra. So don't be sloppy and just take these numbers and pop them in for your c's. Often that's not going to work for them. Sometimes it will, but not always. Okay, so sometimes I see students stop here. Technically, I've done everything I need to do, but I haven't 
quite answered the question here. I'm supposed to find the R of T. I've done all the work for the R of T. I just need to put it all together here. So my actual R of T with this information put in, I'm just going to go back over here and put in my C1, C2, and C3 for the constants here. So T squared plus our C1 is 1. And tangent inverse of T plus C2 is 0. So you don't have to write the plus 0 there. And 1 half e to the 2t plus 5 halves in the k component there. All right, so this is uh, the answer to this problem here uh, in vector notation. So just the, the last step there, making sure you put those constants back in. Of course, you don't have to write this one because that simplifies the tangent inverse of t, uh, but definitely these two, you should put those in there. All right, try some problems like that. Uh, it's a good review of integration skills and then also thinking a little bit about vectors and what it means for two vectors to be equal. Uh, that'll be something we see over and over again this semester.